Before today's topic, a quick disclaimer. The stories and data we share come from the states that we practice in and the experiences we personally had, which can differ greatly across our country and certainly the globe. This is not a professional advice show. So get comfy and let's discuss death. Welcome to Mort Mike, a down-to-earth discussion on death and dying. I'm Jem. And I am Red, and we are your afterlife artisans this week. Humankind has always had a fascination with representing the world around them through art. Whether it be the earliest depictions of stick figures and mammoths etched onto cave walls to the esoteric postmodern lawn sculptures that line hipster strip malls of today. It should come as no surprise that death has had its place amongst these subjects and in so many different forms that persist even to modern times. This week, we're going to delve into funerary art and its various mediums throughout the ages. So I thought a good place to start uh, our journey into funerary art would be with paintings, something that everybody is very familiar with. And honestly, you might have even seen some funerary art uh, through paintings on your own. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an art person. (laughs) I enjoy a good art piece. I do. (laughs) But, you know, especially as someone who is so fascinated by death and death culture, there is a lot of art out there from every single age of art history featuring symbolisms of death whether it be the grim reaper uh people dying in general little skelly bones um so there's a lot of cool stuff out there and we can't possibly touch on the entire history of funeral art through painted media it's one of our longest lasting mediums as a species i'll touch on a few points and pieces i found most intriguing though And this can be broken, in my opinion, into two different thoughts when it comes to funeral art. Paintings that surround death and paintings of actual funeral ceremonies of the dead. Some of the earliest paintings of death that we've uh, found is uh, cave art that was actually found in India and the Philippines. And when these pieces of art were found, it was interpreted as like actual burial scenes. And paintings on walls of tombs was an extremely common practice as well. Um, Basically, huge murals like uh, frescoes and things were found out throughout the entirety of the world in many different cultures. Um, A really good example of this would be the tombs in Egypt. They were filled to the brim with images, carvings, and paintings. And a lot of their imagery was extremely symbolic. These would range from protective symbols to things that would come to life to assist the deceased in the afterlife, uh, to depictions of the mummy of the dead carrying on and doing tasks, completing achievements and sacrificing to the gods. And of course, their gods were plastered all over as well, just for good measure. We already talked about our good boy Anubis in one of our recent episodes. He was all over that uh, stuff. Even art outside of the tombs tended to be death-centric. Egyptians were extremely obsessed with the afterlife. There were also some tombs uh, found in Japan. The Takamatsuzuka tomb in Japan houses some fresco paintings that are actually considered to be one of the country's national treasures. Uh, They depict four male and four female courtiers and some symbolic animal constellations. So, of course, I'd be remiss to not mention um, not just tombs that are painted, but um, specific vessels that were painted. Uh, Obviously, one of the most notorious one would be the uh, Greek painted pottery. And these were found in tombs and around graves that would depict scenes of the descent of Hades to the underworld or some of your favorite psychopomps, Karen and Hermes. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but listening to all these facts, it's really cool that, um, you know, every culture has a different way of handling death and different mythos uh, concerning death but every culture had art so there's kind of like a a a way that this was recorded through art you know um, funerary practices and stuff like that a lot of what we know um, about like what caskets were like back then is because of art 
I'm glad you mentioned that, Jim, because one of the next vessels I wanted to talk about would be sarcophagi. And I didn't want to just go straight into Egyptians again. Uh, so I tried to find some other uh, societies that had sarcophagi. And there's uh, actually is one. The Etruscan sarcophagi would have paintings of the deceased on the sarcophagus themselves. Oh. But, of course, the ancient Egyptians trump pretty much everybody on this. Um, it was actually believed the soul would turn into a bird after death, and then it would be rejoined with the body for rebirth. So the sarcophagi would be painted to look like the deceased, so the bird could more easily find the body uh, again. That's really nice. That's a good uh, good consideration to have for this soul bird. <laughs> and all sorts of hieroglyphics and scenes from the Book of the Dead and Beyond were adorned all over the sarcophagus as well. That's pretty fair, though. Have you ever seen a mummified body for real, for real? It does not look like an actual person. <laughs> <laughs> they, that bird needs all the help it can get. <laughs> they didn't really have fingerprinting systems back then. <laughs> So when you think of an actual painting, um, there are plenty of just paintings of, of death and death scenes. Um, so one of the more interesting ones I found uh, from back in the day was, well, back, 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 back in the day, were what's called mummy portraits. Mm. And these were portraits of the deceased that would be painted onto boards that way they would uh, then attach with a band to the head and the chest of the upper class mummies. So it's like a painting mask almost. Hmm, interesting. And of course, I'm sure you can take a guess where these were found in Egypt. Um, but interesting enough, they they borrowed from the Greco-Roman style of of like how people's faces were painted, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, usually you would think that Egyptians are like coming up with their own stuff going on, but I mean, if they were Doing the same things around the same time in the same general area, why wouldn't they steal some concepts from each other? Absolutely. It was trending on ancient Egyptian <laughs> Trending Instagram, on ancient so. Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and portraiture, of course, was popular elsewhere. The Greeks would paint portraits of the dead on the side of smaller mausoleums, of course, reserved for the rich to be erected in like extremely conspicuous places for people to remember them by. So, of course, like most people with money, this became a competition uh, for them to make bigger and better and greater and grander tombs in better locations with super crazy designs. So any like incoming visitors to the cities would be rubbernecking and checking out what is a funny Greek name that I can insert here? <laughs> this is, what is what is the Billy Bob of ancient Greek? The Greece? Roman Schnoman. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Roman Schnoman. <laughs> oh my god. I was going to say this is also um, still very much practiced today. Has anyone ever been to Hollywood cemeteries? Their tombs there are redonkulous. And it's pretty much a uh, common practice for anyone with money, with any celebrity, to at least consider getting an elaborate tomb uh, for their decaying corpse, if that is what they wish to do. At the turning point of the Renaissance to Baroque to neoclassical and beyond, funeral rites and ceremonies would be depicted by many artists throughout time until our modern day. Like there's literally like hundreds of thousands of these paintings. Like, I could not even like begin to try to walk you through these time periods in, in art history. Um, but I did pick out some striking pieces uh, that I found most awe-inspiring and uh, that I thought we were looking at. Um, and I, of course, you guys can't see it, but I included them in our notes for Jem to take a look at. And so we can we can um, try to describe mm, them. Hey, guys, them. welcome to yeah. our art visual podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, we'll try to do our best here, but you can definitely go look them up uh, yourselves because they are all very cool. I'm looking at them right now. So the first of which uh, being, and I'm going to literally tell you the exact name and then the artist, is the Funeral Scaffold of a Sioux Chief. And this is by Carl Bodmer. And um, for those who don't know what a funeral scaffold was in a lot of Native American cultures, they would do like the sky burials. Um, so they would have like this platform erected where the body would be placed on top and then like various birds of prey or other animals could pick the bones clean. And I just want to put in, there's actually some really cool science behind this that both me and Red learned in mortuary science school, I'm sure. 
But it's common knowledge that a body will decay exposed to air, like up in the air, 10 times faster than a body, you know, underground. Um, so this is actually really super practical. Um, and of course, it goes along with um, most Native American beliefs of, you know, giving back to nature and stuff like this. So having your body become even with am- animal scavengers and things like this, just having your body become part of that is uh, pretty consistent. And I think it's really cool. I really like the science behind it, even though I don't know if they knew the science behind it. I think it's really cool. Yeah, and I think they captured it really well in this in this painting. Uh, the next one we have is called Peasant Funeral by Eric Varen Skiold. It's like where Ren Ski Old. Got it. Got it. Good. <laughs> um, and it's basically just a bunch of, you know, a bunch of men of varying ages and a woman off to the side standing over kind of like it looks like a shallow grave to me and um, yeah. cross with flowers just like a hump of dirt on the ground and the minister or pastor is reading from what looks to be a bible um just kind of depicting like a regular old funeral scene like back in the day i kind of like that this guy over here is like holding a shovel so it's kind of like you know they're there it's with their loved one probably and but they're doing all the work and i think that kind of makes me feel um kind of like looking at you know the death positivity movement like bringing yeah. death care back to the family and and taking care of your own and things like this the next piece that i have um is called the funeral of viking Funeral of Viking. I think I copied that directly from whatever website I was researching. Funeral of Viking. (laughs) So that's what it's called uh, by Frank Dixie, which is spelled D-I-C-K-S-E-E, which is a very unfortunate name. (laughs) Um, (laughs) His middle school years must have been rough. Oh, super rough. (laughs) And uh, yeah, it's, it's, as you would assume, uh, a ship on fire, um, assuming like a funeral pyre out on the water. And a bunch of rowdy Vikings standing around it. Uh, I just really liked the colors that they used in this. Uh, I think they represented the fire really well, having it reflect off the water and everything. This is a very red type of painting. I would see this. Yeah. I can see this in your home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next painting that Red uh, curated for us here is called A Funeral Colon Tribute to Oscar Paniza by George Gross. G-R-O-S-Z. And this is my favorite one that I was able to find because it's so surreal. It's extremely it's so weird. abstract. I see the casket there. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. cool. To, there's tombs back there. It's cool to point out. Are those like niches or windows? Are, oh, oh, is this like in like New Orleans or something like this? I feel like it's a kind of like a New Orleans type of style, f- like funeral parade with the skeletons sitting on top of the casket there. Yeah, I really, I really love... Too. That like the more you look at it, the more stuff that you find. Like I love, <laughs> I love the the priest in the front, just like hands in the <laughs> air, raising the roof, <laughs> hands in the air, like he just don't care. You mean? <laughs> um, I think you know we'll post these to our social media platforms because I really do enjoy all of these. I think it would be cool to share with you guys if you don't want to yeah. do the burden of looking them up yourselves, which I completely understand. Yeah, definitely. So after seeing all that art jump, how how do you feel? What were what in, was invoked in you? <laughs> I feel great. I love looking at art though, and I love death. So I don't know about um, how other people may feel, but it's just very uh, maybe you know I had a little rough of a day, but I feel kind of serene now. I feel I feel um, calm. And that's the best part about art, that art is subjective, that as long as it makes you feel something, whether it's anger or pain or happiness, that's the point. Mm -hmm. Today's artists are extremely vast and varied, and there are plenty doing art about death and the emotions adjacent to it. Um, An example would be Ange Hills. He is a speed artist, and he painted a portrait of George Floyd in under three minutes uh, during his funeral. Mm. Um, And of course, there's a flourish of artists who do memorial portraiture of the dead to be displayed at funerals and to be cherished keepsakes. Mm. 
Now, this is kind of a, this almost didn't make the cut, but I'm putting it in anyway. <laughs> so the most interesting form of painting I found during my studies was from the funeral ceremonies of indigenous Australian peoples. They practice forms of body paint in their day-to-day lives just in general, but the patterns and the colors change when there's been a death in the community. Oh, I've never heard of this before. What would it, what would it look like if they were... Um celebrating a death in their community i couldn't find any pictures of it (laughs) oh that's so cool though yeah it was super understudied Mm. unfortunately Mm. and also i just uh, i wanted to see it so bad but the websites that i was looking at so looked Mm. so besides paintings obviously there's other kinds of art something that is seen almost all the time in cemeteries pyramids, uh, mausoleums, uh, any sort of like memorial or monument are statues and physical things that represent certain certain ideas, certain symbolism. And what come to what comes to mind first obviously is uh, the tombs as we discussed before in like cemeteries and how elaborate those could be, especially when um, they started to become a symbol of wealth and success in life. Uh, Like I said before, it's still prevalent today. Not as much um, maybe in me and Red's generation as we are not wealthy at all in general. (laughs) (laughs) um, When I used to work at a cemetery, um, there were definitely some well-to-do older folks that would come in and just drop like thousands and thousands of dollars on a stone house that your dead body would live in for the rest of eternity. (laughs) (laughs) And they were really, really cool to look at, but a very, um, very art-based thing. No, besides housing your dead body, which, you know, honestly doesn't need to be housed like that. Um, Just a very symbolic um, piece of information that you were very successful in life. But also a lot in monuments of war. The Ottoman Empire was actually known to create structures from the skulls of rebel fighters in order to elicit terror among its opponents. Imagine a giant skull house tower of the skulls of all of your friends and brothers and uh, loved ones. That's that's probably pretty terrifying. Extremely brutal. (laughs) You can look online, but the skull tower was constructed on the road from Istanbul to Belgrade. And it was built of sand and limestone and obviously skulls, like actual human skulls. And of course, another really striking, um, I I don't want to say art piece, maybe funerary piece that a lot of people might have heard about before is called uh, the Terracotta Army, which is a collection of terracotta sculptures located in China. This is a wild, wild, crazy kind of feet it's kind of one of those things where you look back and you're like how and why did they do this but uh essentially if you guys have never heard of this before this is an an army of life-sized people horses chariots musicians officials acrobats um and most importantly soldiers constructed out of you know terracotta which is clay but basically, okay, so 8,000 life-size soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 life-sized real-life horses made out of terracotta. And so the purpose of this whole big crazy thing was to protect the um, first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang. Um, and that's like, that's it. They just made this art piece for him when he died, which obviously symbolizes how important protecting the emperor in his afterlife was to these people back in, it was like early 200 BCE, so before Common Era. Just like thinking about how they did that back then and how long it must have took or how many people it involved is just like so cool to me. Yeah, especially with, I mean, I've always been a mummy girl. So same thing with like the Egyptians and like all of the thought processes that these cultures put into like we want to keep protecting and prepare our deceased, you know, leader in the best way possible. Like it's it's crazy to think that they did this much backbreaking labor just to try to help them out. It's really their crazy. Afterlife. Imagine if mm. we did this for like important people that died today. There's no way. 
No. Like, I don't know. <laughs> what if, uh, I can't even think of like a good dead person right now. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, as there are paintings, there are as many just general art sculptures revolving around death. Um, there's a lot of stuff like this um, in tombs around the world. And actually, one of my favorites that I heard about recently is called Memorial to a Marriage by Patricia Cronin. And this is a similar sculpture created for a tomb for two very specific people. Um, but uh, it's basically the one of the considered one of the first um, marriage equality monuments in the world. So Patricia Cronin um, is a lesbian and she was partnered um, with her partner, lifelong partner, Deborah Cass, who is also an artist. So the statue depicts two women laying together, um, kind of in a very innocent but extremely intimate way. Basically, you guys can look this up again. It's called A Memorial to a Marriage. And it's um, two women laying together, kind of like cuddling um, on a slab of stone. And there's like a sheet over them. And they're just laying there together and holding each other. And it's really um, beautiful. And I really uh, love it a lot. And you should go look at it. Um, but basically, it was completed in 2002 when... Um, uh, marriage equality was still illegal in the United States, um, if anyone can remember that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and it was basically kind of a memorial to these uh, women who loved each other, but you know couldn't share the same symbolic love that other people were able to share during that time. And I think it speaks to a lot of people, um, especially myself now. So when uh, marriage equality basically, I guess, arrived in 2015, I absolutely remember that day. Um, that's when um, kind of like what the statue was for and like what it depicted. So it was considered the first uh, like marriage equality um, statue that exists in uh, contemporary art. I don't know. I just think it's beautiful. It has been removed from the cemetery that it was in um, and no. kind of replicated and put on um, exhibition across the country and the world. But it really um, is just kind of like an homage to marriage equality and death, which are like two very important things to me. So I would definitely recommend checking it out. And if you ever want to see um, death statues, death, like physical art forms of death, I mean, just take a trip to your local cemetery, like an older cemetery, and you'll be able to find so many good examples of, of just breathtaking, breathtaking stonework. Another popular thing in cemeteries that I um, kind of was really popular when I was working there and people got done a lot, and we talked about this with paintings, is having, you know, paintings of the deceased present. But um, when photography, you know, was invented and became popular, obviously the idea of um, death iconography and paintings transferred over to that. And I would even say that photography is one of the biggest art forms when it comes to death um, today. Death photography became most popular in the 1850s and 60s, uh, of course, because that's right around the time that photography was invented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so a lot of the facts that um, I'll be telling you guys today, I got from a recommended reading for you guys. It's called uh, Beyond the Dark Veil, and it is a gorgeous book. It's got almost 200 photographs that document the, the 19th century postmortem photography movement. Uh, so highly recommend that as a reading, um, especially if you don't like reading too much. It's mostly pictures. So everyone loves a good picture book. <laughs> I am so excited. I love post-mortem photography. It is so wild. Yeah. I would be remiss to not have a little nerd out right now about um, the types of photography there were back then uh, before there was digital photography and even like what we know as like film now. Um 
so there were there were three different main types of photography methods and it started off with the daguerreotype in 1839 so these photos uh they had you had to look at them from an angle because it's it's silver on copper and it's developed over hot mercury after exposure to light oh my god that sounds like the most toxic thing i've ever heard in my life oh i'm so bad for you i can't imagine a photographer's lifespan was very long back in the day (laughs) Um, and then after that, the ambro type was developed, and that's the successor to the daguerreotype, type, but not in quality, more so in the cost and ease of production. So uh, the ambro type formed a negative image on glass, and then the back was painted uh, with either black or like a, a dark varnish so you could see mm. um, the negative clearly. And then the last major uh, form of photography uh, at that time was around the like 1860s and all the way to like the 1900s. It was like the longest lasting form. Um, it was a direct positive on a darkly painted piece of iron. And these these photos, like all of these photos, took anywhere from like three minutes to 20 or 30 minutes to develop depending on how much exposure was needed so especially like dark rooms and like unlit houses you would need to have people sit forever for these photos to come out and that's why the myth that they say it's not a myth it's true the fact that they say um the people in like all the old-timey pictures they don't smile is because imagine trying to hold a smile for 30 minutes (laughs) right exactly And like in the early inception of photography, this was a extremely expensive, like extremely expensive process. And so like the only photo a family might have had of their loved one would just be this death photography, especially if it was like a child who died. So they, they might have only had one picture of, of the deceased and it was of them dead. Which is like so sad to think about if you like look at your phone now you have so many i have like a thousand pictures of my cat imagine like not- <laughs> <laughs> and i don't have kids so you know but imagine just not having that and i think you know having keepsakes and reminders and memorials is so important to people it's you know why paintings and sarcophagi and sculptures existed back in the day now they have photography they can take an actual still real life shot of what this person used to look like but if they died before that ever happened, um, they still look pretty okay a couple hours to a day after death. So why not? Right, exactly. Actually, I thought it was pretty funny uh, that while I was looking through all this, this collection of photos, um, that some members of the family would have like blurred faces or hands because even people back then, like they couldn't, like we talked about, we, they just couldn't be sitting for that long. <laughs> some things, some things really, uh, really never change. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. So half of the photography is depicted in like lifelike poses where some people would be sitting in chairs or they'd be stood up or sleeping, not like in the casket, but like legitimately like napping, like, or being held while sleeping, like a baby being held while it's sleeping. So like the, the, a lot of posing and posturing was done for the deceased. To give the illusion of some of the poses, people would like shroud themselves and hold up the deceased in some of the pictures. And some of it's like super obvious, <laughs> like uh, like almost looking like the Charlie Brown ghost costume, but like in the background holding up a dead baby. Oh, <laughs> like no. it's wild. It's I just I love this so much. It's so wild, guys. <laughs> like it's so wild because, and you know, some of them are bad, like Red said, but some of them are so good. I actually used to follow. I don't remember if this was a Tumblr account or a Twitter account. But there was this count that would go and take post-mortem pictures from ye olden times and they would be like, okay, guess guess which one is alive and guess which one is dead. Because, you know, there would be family members in the pictures with these people and sometimes it was extremely difficult to tell. And it was um, very amusing that, you know, they this was like an art form, posing the bodies and making it appear as if they were sleeping or just even sitting um, with their eyes closed or I, I think even like open sometimes. Um, very, very interesting stuff. I just I I am maybe a little sad that we moved away from the practice, um, but uh, very interesting still. <laughs> 
I also thought it was interesting that in some of the positioning and framing that special steps were taken to also like minimize focus on decomposition or injuries. And then some photos like you could just see purge like just right there, mm. like or bleeding wounds, <laughs> like absolutely crazy. So even though the deceased was going to be like the center focus of the photo, there's a lot of other things that were usually included in the framing. So you'd see uh, a lot of times like tons of flowers uh, around the head, around the feet, hands, under the beds. And a lot of the times this was just like in general, like not just for the photo, but that was just to mask the smell uh, mm. since people were, you know, at home for a long time before they were actually laid to rest. And... um. Props were also used, and anywhere from the symbolic plants and flowers to a child's favorite toy, hobby items, and some things uh, were displayed that have actually lost their meaning over time, and some things we just can't draw a connection to. Um, for example, one that was kind of weird uh, was a child holding an empty shoe, uh, and that apparently meant... Uh, a common practice for a child's life being cut short in the Victorian area. So mm. all, all sorts of weird things you'd see in these pictures that we have no idea why they were holding what they were holding. So backdrops and draping was also a very prominent feature in uh, death photography. So like either as a backdrop or a way to like symbolize the veil between life and the afterlife in these photos. So, of course, even though this was an extremely common practice, uh, there was still a taboo that emerged of taking pictures of the deceased. Uh, for example, Lincoln, when he passed away, there was only, like, one picture of his body. Apparently, the Secretary of War limited this, so, like, photographers couldn't profit off all the pictures they could take of his body because he was on, like, this huge cross-country, you know, death train which sounds like a really cool <laughs> band name again. Death Train. <laughs> well, also, wasn't it true? We talked about this in our um, embalming episode, I think, is that this was one of the first, like, widely publicized, like, oh, he's embalmed, so he's going to look beautiful for a long right. time. So I think the picture of him, which I think you can still go find somewhere, is to kind of showcase, wow, he looks so good and he's been dead for uh, like three weeks. I don't know. Yeah, honestly, the whole story of like Lincoln's train possession, uh, it's its its crazy. Like that would be <laughs> an entire episode to itself. Like he was, his body was moved so many times, like buried, reburied, like gr there was grave robbers, all sorts of things. So yeah, definitely. There's like a good documentary about it. Definitely look it up. Tune in next time on more. <laughs> <laughs> we will though one day. But yeah, you're right. There is now obviously an extreme taboo of taking pictures of the deceased. Extreme. I would say extreme taboo at least. I would agree. Yeah. So yeah, I've actually I've had very few people ask me as well for photography, like to be able to take pictures of the casket. Um, it seems more common in like other cultures that I've served, mm -hmm. like while well, I've done like a Hindu service or whatever, and like they're always you know, zooming or like having a webcasting, and like they want us to show like the body so people from like overseas can see. You know, that is true. I definitely do want to clarify that we are talking about, like, American burial practices here. Right, exactly. Because, yeah, other countries, it's it's a lot less taboo. But, yeah, I mean, inside of our own culture, I mean, it's extremely rare to have somebody come take pictures. Uh, or, like, yeah, I'll get that, too, where people will, like, ask me as if it's illegal to yeah. take a picture <laughs> of their loved one. <laughs> it's not illegal. Um if you are, I would, ass uh, I would assume if you are, obviously, if you're the family, if you're the next of kin, um, it's your decision to make. If you are a stranger going to a funeral, it can be seen as highly offensive, and I would not do it. Possibly illegal? I don't know. Yeah, I would say that would definitely be like a not okay thing to yeah. do. Like, if you were not part of the family, you should not be taking pictures of dead people. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, one story that sticks out in my mind is actually when I was not a funeral um, associate, but I was a doing my medical investigator job and um, never in my job before this moment was I asked about pictures or anything like this. Obviously, with my funeral background, I very much liked to have a sort of pseudo last rite ritual with every family that I serviced. 
Um, so as, you know, we can talk about this more later, but as the medical uh, investigator representing the medical examiner, I'm not a funeral director, but I would always be like, you know, if you guys need to take a moment to say goodbye, um, take your time, just let me know when you're ready because, you know, you never want to rush this thing. For me, it's my job. I do it every day, like five times a day, but for them, um, you know, and we always say this, one of the most um, defining times of your life possibly So I always try to do that for the families. And this one time I was with a family and um, the partner of this person who died came up to me and they were like, "Um, you know, is it, is it okay if I like, if I take a picture? And I was like, yeah, dude, like you can do whatever you want, man. It's like, this is your home. Like this is your, your loved one. Like I'm not going to call the cops or nothing. Like the cops are already here, but you know, um, it's just very, it was very interesting that she, she almost didn't do it. And then I could tell she was holding her phone in her hands with the camera app open. And I was like, she's going to ask me. And then she was like very afraid to ask me. And it's like, it's, you know, I wish that that wasn't there because it is such a taboo thing. And if that is something that is going to help you, even if you never look at those pictures again, even if you do, I think it's so important just to have that grief experience, however you think feels right. And sometimes you don't know what it's going to be until it actually happens to you. So if you want to take some pictures on your iPhone, like I say, go ahead and do it. I agree. No, I think that especially considering that we document every single other thing in our lives and post it on Instagram, like food that we eat, <laughs> like why should like pictures of your loved one not be the same? Like, I will say the one thing I do see that's more common, people will take pictures like at the cemetery of the closed casket with the flowers. And it's just like, oh, we're so close. Like if people only felt comfortable enough to do the same to commemorate their loved one, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. Now, I will say uh, there is a, a very wrong way to go about this. Um, I was working a visitation uh, once in a very large metro area, and a younger gentleman had died, uh, or actually, rather, he was killed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he had, since he was younger, he had a bunch of young friends that were uh, showing up as well. And so there was like this this couple of guys that came in, some of his friends, and they came into the, the balls, I will say, came into the funeral home with like tall boy natties, <laughs> like <laughs> drinking at the funeral. Oh, like cans of yeah, the beers. Like, <laughs> yeah, the beers. Hell yeah. Like, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and they waltz up to the casket and they're already like stumbling and mm. they take out their phones to take a selfie like of themselves with the casket and the deceased like behind them mm. like while still holding onto these natty cans mm. and i'm just like that's that there's a line and that line was crossed <laughs> yeah i mean i i want to be on the fence but especially because their judgment was impaired clearly um and also the fact that they were probably not um next of kin slash immediate family members that might they have been not. extremely <laughs> offensive to the family did you have to handle that situation or was it just kind of like um what did you do? It was kind of one of those let's shoo them out. Yeah. They also like knocked over candles after that oh, too. It God, was like yeah. it was a whole thing. That's so that's the thing yeah. is like don't take pictures of someone else's dead person and post them on Facebook. You know what I mean? Like that's where the line is. Uh, <laughs> even if we do get back to like social acceptance of uh, death photography and post mortem ph- photography, which would be really cool, honestly, I think that there is there still does need to be a level of respect there. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it is not necessarily a defined line uh, for who can take pictures of whose dead body. Um, Because obviously, like, you have to take photos for your job to aid in investigation. Mm -hmm. And like, but I mean, myself being in the embalming room, like I've been warned, not that I was personally needing to be warned, but just like, don't let us catch you doing this kind of thing. Like, I'm not allowed to take pictures of the dead body. Mm -hmm. Um and I mean, unless I have explicit permission from the family, um, and I, it, it, there, there is definitely a line. Uh, we actually had um, an apprentice at one of the funeral homes that I worked at that posted a picture. Did I already tell the story? I don't know. I don't think so. I've never heard this, okay. but I have a terrible okay. fish memory. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So this apprentice was on a transfer and had taken a selfie uh, once she picked up 
the body from the hospital of like it was a I mean, granted covered cot, mm-hmm. but still outline of body mm-hmm. uh, on the cot. And she had posted it to her social media. Mm. And she also had the funeral home that we worked at on her social media. Stop. And she like one of her friends reported her yeah. and uh, she got fired like immediately, yeah. like no tolerance for that kind of thing. So like, yeah, I mean, not illegal, but a lot of businesses in the death industry have policies against this for sure just to protect the identity of their clients and to retain clients because i mean who would want to use that funeral if they knew that one of the employees was like posting pictures of their loved ones online yeah it's a huge breach of privacy i actually and you know something that is maybe you guys have seen before that is kind of interesting is that there are um um if you're interested in like death and forensics and stuff you can find uh, social media profiles that post pictures of dead people, but oftentimes you'll notice that the identifiers are like heavily removed, and oftentimes you cannot tell either what type of person it is or like remotely who the person may have been in life. Um, also, they are mostly secretive about like where they work or like they don't post recent cases or like high profile cases. Um, so this would be like an okay way that you can post about death, but these people also usually have explicit permissions from the powers that be. They're not just like taking pictures of like um, decomposing bodies and maggots and just like posting it online without permissions. Like that would get you fired, probably. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Very very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, like immediate expulsion. Mm -hmm. So if you it's one of those things, again, if you have to ask yourself, is this okay? Is this right? Uh, This is probably a no. Mm. (laughs) But all that aside, I do think post-mortem photography and iconography and even though tombs are a um, cough, cough, waste of resources, I do think that (laughs) they are very beautiful art pieces that can be um, admired and really important for social art history. But as it is readily apparent to everyone listening now by this point, this is an audio medium that we're communicating through you to. Do yourselves a favor and look up some of these time periods and art pieces. These works range from the strange to the breathtaking, and us spewing facts about them at you isn't going to do them near enough justice. We will also be posting um, a series of the pictures and sculptures and uh, cool art pieces and postmodern photography that we kind of discussed in this episode. Um, so definitely be sure to keep an eye out for that if you either are lazy like me and don't Google things or if you <laughs> just forget. So definitely keep an eye out for that. But that's going to be it this week for Mort Mike. We'd love to connect with you guys on our socials, so like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Mort Mike Podcast. It would mean a lot to hear your feedback, so please tell us what you think in a comment and drop us a rating on whatever podcast hosting site you use. If you have any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear about or some burning questions you might have about death, shoot us an email at mortmikepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to give a huge thank you to our friend Marson for the use of his song titled Deputies of Death, which he produced just for our show. You can check out his Bandcamp at marsonmusic.bandcamp.com. Thank you, Marson. And be sure to tune in the first Thursday of every month for some more casual discussions on death. Thank you so much for listening. This has been Mort Mike. Bye. Bye.